Hello everyone, this is week four of Introduction to Museology and Museum Studies. Today's topic is engaging different learning styles in museums. In the past few lectures, I've been focusing on different cultural identities and how you as an individual can get different things from a museum if you're from a different uh, country or something like that. But today I'm going to be focusing more on different learning styles, which is a huge thing in museums, because I think with your different learning style, people can get different um, people can get different things from an exhibit, but they can also come to the same conclusion by focusing on their different learning styles, if that makes sense. So just to start, I want to highlight again that museums are designed for learning. They're designed for the promotion of knowledge. So they need to make their structure and their exhibits accessible to a great variety of people. And they need to, um, they need to understand these people. I think first there's understanding and then there's promoting different learning styles. So that'll come through today. Uh, whether intentionally or not, museums embody views about what's worth learning and the way that artworks, objects, and historical material are presented. I think this is interesting too, the whether intentionally or not, because sometimes museums can try their best to highlight a certain learning style or a certain idea, but then they might ignore other ideas or they might um, highlight something different than they thought. Um, museums have always been designed with education and visitor experience in mind. I've sort of talked in the past about how museums have been designed with education, but visitor experience is an important thing as well. And as I hope you'll learn today, visitor experience is developing um, quickly. A lot of the visitor experience now can be highlighted through technology. I'll talk about mo that more in my uh, class focus specifically on technology, but I think this is really important and what distinguishes museums today from museums in the past. I thought it would be important to go through the different learning styles before we go forward. So visually, you prefer to use pictures, diagrams, images, and spatial understanding to help you learn. Um, I guess right now I'm using visual learning to explore this because I'm showing you the different learning styles that can happen. Um, a lot of times in museums, you'll see different time periods being explored through a visual timeline or something like that. So that would be for visual people. Musical auditory, you prefer using sounds or music or even rhythms to help you learn. I think this would be explored. I've seen a couple musical exhibits where you can sort of listen to different different music from different time periods or explore an exhibit through auditory listening at your own pace. So you're sort of internalizing things without, maybe you're not really being aware that you're internalizing certain things, but you are learning. Physical and kinesthetic, you can use your hands, body, and sense of touch to help you learn. You might act things out. So often in museums, maybe you'll notice you can you can put on outfits and costumes from different time periods, or you can sort of act out a scene or something like that. And often museums also will have objects that are replicas of the actual objects. So you can sort of touch these objects and see what they're like in that way. Um, I know I've experienced exhibitions before where people, once they hold a certain object in their hand, they can sort of connect that to emotional feelings. That's especially relevant if the exhibit is, you know, within a period where people would, um, would remember a time period. Um, so like within the last 50 years or something like that. Solitary, you like to work alone, you use self-study and prefer your own company when learning. Um, solitary is a, a lot of people think museums in general are very solitary, but as you might know, and as I know, museums, they can be social as well, but often 
museums you can walk around by yourself and you can determine where you want to go and if you want to spend the entire time staring at one painting or object then you can uh you can do that more when you're on your own you can sort of realize where your interest takes you or something like that and then yeah there's social so there will be spaces in a museum where you can where you can engage with other people i think museums do this in their structure like sometimes you'll see cafes being close to exhibits so you can sort of talk about what you learned or you know or you can there's another way you can be social as well you can sort of leave your thoughts and then read other people's thoughts that's kind of social as well if you don't want to actually talk to people there's different understandings of different things and logical mathematical learning is easier for you if you if you use logic reasoning systems and sequences so this is really interesting i've seen this sometimes in like um calligraphy or Egyptian Egyptian exhibits sort of trying to understand language learning if you're sort of trying to use your logic to um, to bring that to an exhibit. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is engaging children in museums. Uh, this is really important because schools will often bring children to the museum and it's often their first exposure to, you know, the world at large or different modes of understanding. I think it's really important to bring people to museums at a young age because what you get from a museum at that age is sort of what guides you in the future. And yeah, you might, you might see something as a child that, that you're wondering about. And then yeah, you'll go through the museum and try and find more of those like objects or something like that. That's why it says museums spark curiosity. They engage critical thinking skills and offer historical lessons not taught in schools. I think this is a really important mode of museums. They offer a different learning space, an alternative learning space. So it's it doesn't really feel like you're learning in a classroom, although often museums will have separate classrooms if a teacher wants to do a, a different exercise. Teachers will often, I mean, museums, they do often have um, material for students to learn. So like engaging material. Visiting a museum opens the door for your child's curiosity. Visiting museums encourage language learning and connects it to larger ideas. So I think that's important too. Um, as I've said before, museums, they do present these large ideas and they do need to make different ways of making these large ideas understandable to different learning styles. And in this case, children's learning styles. Uh, yeah, museums present new ideas and they spark creativity. The next thing I'm going to be talking about is disabilities in museums. This is hugely important when we're talking about engagement because people with disabilities are a huge portion of our society. Um, museums, to highlight again, museums play a crucial role in society by educating the public and representing diverse aspects of culture through their exhibits. So yeah, museums need to appeal to these people as well. It's important to make museums accessible. Um, the word accessible is going to be very broad. Accessibility doesn't just mean making sure it's wheelchair accessible. It means making sure it accommodates different learning styles, different backgrounds, um, making sure the exhibits are visually, visually um, understandable. And yeah, museums are designed to be inclusive. Therefore, it is important to include those people who experience barriers while learning. You'll see a lot of museums have have ways to make sure that disabilities and different learning styles are included. I'm going to show you one right now, which is um, from the Museum of Modern Art.
Um, a lot of museums will have a, a guide on their website, which you can use prior to the visit, during the visit, and after the visit. Um, so this one, a social guide, a trip to the Museum of Modern Art, it's designed for first time visitors, families, or visitors with developmental disabilities. Um, something I want to say here is that the people with disabilities are equated with the first time visitors and families, so there's no sort of um, making them different. So just showing what you're going to expect. A lot of people have anxiety about not knowing what to expect when they go to a museum or where to go. Again, looking at the entrance. Audio guides. This is something I talked about earlier. Audio guides can help people who might be visually impaired or people who might um, prefer a more solitary visit or um, a museum experience without a guide, but sort of still getting relevant information. Yeah, this is for visual learners or people who learn through text. You might not, when you're going to a museum, you might not recognize these types of people, but that helps them there. Accessibility. Social learning. A sensory map, I'm going to show you another example of a sensory map, but a lot of museums will have um, a map of their whole museum where you can sort of see different areas where you might expect different modes of um, interaction, like where you might go if you want to have a more quiet experience or where the cafe is where you can talk more and things like that. This is another example of ways that museums can promote engagement and can help with accessibility. This is from the Smithsonian Museum. Um, a lot of museums will have mornings at the museum or specific hours where people with different learning capabilities can explore the exhibits without feeling anxious or feeling like they're taking up other people's time. So yeah, I think this is really cool and I think it's something that should be adopted in many museums. Um, you'll also see night at the museum for those people who might be more social. So you can sort of explore the museum while holding a cocktail or something like that. I'm going to show you another museum and show you what they've done with accessibility. Just give me a minute here. So this is the New York Transport Museum. And what they've done is they've created an after school program where people with autism who have an extreme interest in trains can explore the museum at their own pace. The great thing about this program is that these people with autism, they understand trains, so they are more inclined to talk to other people who understand trains. So it sort of encourages communication, interaction and things like that. And it just makes them feel safe. So yeah, a lot of museums too, their aim is to sort of relieve anxiety and make museum learning just really fun. This is another example of a museum I wanted to show you when we're talking about different learning styles. Um, this is the Hayward Gallery in London. I'm just going to talk about some of the images that we'll see here. So as you can see, the museum exhibits, they're making it more appealing to visual learners. So they're creating a space where you can sort of just observe the object without distractions. I think that's interesting too. This is another way that you can learn. You know, they're creating a space where you can sort of relax and focus on only certain things at a time. So that's something too that I should talk about 
museums sometimes they can they can be loud for people so you can be looking at an exhibit but you can be hearing people or you can be hearing films on a loop or something like that that's why sometimes sensory maps will show places where you can have spaces like this or where you can avoid um multimedia and things like that so yeah these are really cool too just creating spaces where you can focus on just specific objects this is more abstract i would say from reading about this exhibit i know that the aim the curator aimed for people to sort of focus on the space that isn't being used in this exhibition so yeah that's something that can be explored in museums so yeah just now i spoke about museums having sensory maps and i think this is really important this specific sensory map is from a museum i worked in the museum of scottish lighthouses so you'll see in the map it indicates that there's an av room here so if you were looking at this map, you'd be able to see that if you were looking at the gallery right here, you might possibly hear the multimedia that's happening there. And for some people that might not bother them, but for other people, such as people on the spectrum or people who want a quieter space, they, want, they would want to keep this in mind. I think it's really important for accessibility and making the most out of your museum visit. I think that's important. You need to realize, especially if you're working in a museum, that it, um, a certain learning style may not might not be your learning style, but it would be very appreciative for, from another person. The last thing I wanted to impress upon you all is that museums improve health and well-being. Um, they do it in a lot of different ways. Um, especially children, you can go into a museum and you can have a physical craft that you make in a craft room or something like that. So you can apply the ideas that you've been learning in a museum and have something tangible that you can leave the museum with. So this connects to the beginning of the lecture when I said that some people, they learn from tactile objects and they learn from creating things of their own and applying their own skills to ideas. Uh, knitting groups, that would be a more solitary thing, but again, for tactile learners. Um, yeah, museums, they provide positive social experiences, learning and acquiring new skills. I think a great thing about museums is that there's no bias in museums. Um, there's no There's no prior knowledge you need to know before you go into a museum. It just it tells you an unbiased opinion and you can take what you want from it. Calming experiences, increased positive emotions, increased self-esteem. I think this relates to the idea of when you go into a museum, you can sort of curate your own experience and you can take what you want from exhibits, but at the end, you know that you got what you intended from a museum. So increased self-esteem just means you learned something and a sense of identity and community. I've been talking about this throughout the entire course, but um, a sense of community, this, you, you can learn about your cultural identity, you can learn about, maybe at the end of a museum, you learn about how you learn, and just communication. I think there's so much you can learn from museums. And I think if you just put a little of your own self and you just let yourself internalize ideas that you'll you'll get something from a museum and that's really important i think thank you again for tuning in and for watching um i spoke a little about technology in museums and that's a huge part of engagement as well but my last lecture is going to focus exclusively on technology so i've been kind of i've been talking about this a little bit but not fully because that's an idea I'm going to bring about in the end. And my next video is going to be about difficult histories. So that's going to highlight something I've talked about a little before, 
but sort of talk about how you can approach and tell stories that might be might be related to tragedy or might be related to a community that might be not be ready to tell their story ideas like that so yeah i hope you guys are learning a lot from these videos and again thank you for watching